On May 21, 1941, Betty Albright and her three-year-old son, Eldridge, traveled to her mother's house in rural Woodstock, Maryland. Betty had asked her mother if she would look after her son for the afternoon so Betty could catch up on some much needed sleep. They arrived at Betty's mother's house at about 1.30 and right away Betty went inside, handed her son to her mom and went upstairs to take a nap. As for Eldridge and his grandmother, they went out in the backyard to play. Now Eldridge loved going to his granny's house because she had this enormous backyard for him to play in. If you were standing on her back porch looking out, it would be 250 meters of just open grass for him to run around in, and it butted up against this huge forest. And in the middle of her property, looking straight out at the forest, there was this three meter gap in the trees that if you walked through it, it would bring you down to this creek bed that was seasonal, and there was very rarely any water running through it. From the porch, anyone that was standing in this creek bed, you could clearly see. And so Eldridge was allowed to play in the creek bed, so long as he didn't go right or left in the creek, which would put him out of view from anybody on the porch. And so this particular day, when Eldridge and his grandmother went outside, Eldridge wanted to go play in the creek bed. So he immediately starts running across the yard towards it, along with his grandmother's three dogs. As for his grandmother, she just didn't have it in her to go all the way down to the creek bed. So she decided she would just sit on the porch and read a book and keep her eye on Eldridge. She remembers watching her grandson go all the way across the yard get to the break in the trees, and then step down into the creek bed where he began goofing around with the dogs and throwing rocks and having a good time, clearly in view. And for the next five, 10 minutes, she just stared directly at her grandson and the dogs. And at some point she picked up the book next to her and she began reading the book and then periodically looking up to check on her grandson and then back down to the book. At about 2 p.m. she was looking down at her book when she heard her grandson yell out for help. Now, three-year-olds yell out for help all the time. Sometimes it's a big deal, and sometimes it's not such a big deal. But oftentimes, the sound of their voice gives away how serious it is. No matter what they say, it's like their tone gives away, should I take this seriously, or is this just a kid being a three-year-old? And she would say that the way he was yelling sounded like a real emergency. When she poked her head up, even though she had seen him, you know, less than a minute ago, playing in the gap in the trees, now she's looking and he and the dogs are gone. And so of course she's alarmed. She hops out of her seat, she goes down the steps and she starts walking across the yard towards Eldridge. And she's yelling his name and she's walking quickly. When she got about halfway across the yard, she heard Eldridge yell out again, except this time his voice was coming from way off in the forest way farther away from the last time he had yelled out. It gave the impression to her that he had moved a great distance from the last time he yelled to her. And it triggered something inside of her that was telling her something is terribly wrong. And she began running towards the creek bed, still no sign of the dogs. She can't see anything. She's just running towards the creek bed. When she gets about 10 meters away from the break in the trees, she hears her grandson yell out for a third time, barely audible, way off in the forest. He yells out for help, and as he's yelling, it sounds like someone has stifled him and covered his mouth mid-yell. So she runs through the break in the trees down to the creek bed where she stops, and she looks out in front of her, and it's just dense forest, and there's no eldridge, there's no dogs, there's nothing. She looks to her right down the creek bed, and there's nothing down there, and then she looks to her left, and one of her dogs is in the creek bed, maybe 10 meters away, facing away from her, and the dog is positioned in such a way that it's clearly looking at something. And so she runs down to the dog thinking she's gonna see maybe Eldridge or the other dogs, but there's nothing beyond the dog. The dog is just rooted to the spot. Its hair is raised, it's growling, and it's taking little steps back, like it's been spooked at whatever it's seen or whatever it's looking at. And she just looked up and tried to look in the direction the dog was looking, but there was nothing, it was just forest. And so at this point, she felt certain that someone must have abducted Eldridge. And so she turns, she tries to pull the dog to come with her, but the dog's not budging. And so she runs back to the house to wake up Eldridge's mother. The two of them come back down to the creek bed. The dog is still in the same position, growling and staring in the same direction as if whatever it's looking at hasn't gone anywhere. And they look for a couple more minutes. They're yelling for Eldridge. And the grandmother is telling her daughter, look, I think he's been abducted. We gotta call the authorities. And finally she relents. And so they do manage to get the dog. They run back to the house and they call the police. Shortly thereafter, the state police showed up with this huge contingent of searchers. And they immediately went down to the creek bed where they started pushing predominantly to the left side, which is where the dog was angled. And it was also where the grandmother had heard her grandson yelling from. And very quickly police discovers 
some of Eldridge's footprints about 50 meters down on the left side of the creek bed. They were in some sand right at the edge and they were walking away as if he was leaving the area he had been told to stay in, which was in that gap in the trees. But interestingly, the footprints, it looked like he had been walking for maybe 20 or 30 meters when inexplicably the prints just stopped as if he stopped in the sand where he was. But had he gone right, left, straight, turned around, had he gone in any direction, there would have been additional prints in the sand, but there wasn't, which gave the impression that was where someone must have lifted him up and kidnapped him but they never found any prints connected to a kidnapper. For the rest of the day and that night, they would not find any more signs of Eldridge or the other two missing dogs. The next day, about 24 hours after Eldridge had gone missing, there were a number of search crews that had gone well outside of the primary search area in hopes of maybe finding one of the two lost dogs because they thought maybe they could bring them to the lost child. And this one crew that was four miles away from where Eldridge had gone missing, they were walking past a swamp when one of them heard what sounded like a child whimpering and it was coming from inside the swamp. And so immediately they turn and start walking into the swamp, which had fairly deep water. And they get to this clearing and they see there's this rocky overhang with high grass all around it, kind of forming like a cave. And they hear this whimpering again and it's coming from underneath that rock. And they rush over and they're pulling the grass aside. And sure enough, tucked underneath this rock inside of this kind of makeshift cave is Eldridge. He was laying on this really well-constructed bed of leaves that looked like an animal's den. So either Eldridge had found an animal's den or he had built himself this beautiful bed of leaves. When they approached him, he was sleeping underneath this rock. And so that whimpering sound he was making, he must have been making in his sleep. And so as they got closer to him, he woke up and he kind of sat up and he's very groggy and confused. You know, all of his clothes were really badly torn up and he wasn't wearing any shoes, but he overall seemed okay. He just was very confused seeming. And so they scooped him up and they brought him back to search headquarters, reunited him with his mother and his grandmother. And everyone's just so relieved that he's alive. But at the same time, people were like, how did he get four miles away in the middle of a swamp? And so after the doctor cleared him saying he was okay besides some scratches and bruises, the police along with the mother and the grandmother sat down with Eldridge and asked him, you know, what happened? But unfortunately, Eldridge appeared to not know this had even happened. He didn't even know he had spent 24 hours out in the middle of the woods by himself. It was like he had blacked the whole thing out. Because Eldridge was found alive and unharmed, the police did not continue to investigate this case. And so we don't know what caused him to suddenly be yelling for help and appear to be drifting farther and farther into the woods. We don't know what the dog saw in the creek that scared it so badly. We don't know how Eldridge moved four miles through a dense forest over multiple swamps only to wind up in yet another swamp inside of a cave. Although the police came out and said Eldridge must have just wandered off on his own, basically everybody involved in this case believes someone or something abducted him. It's just very fortunate he was found alive. Unfortunately, there's no clarification about what happened to the other two dogs, although the way it's worded in the story, it does sound like they were never found. In the 1950s, the Thorpe family lived in Dunbar, Pennsylvania, which was a small town of less than 1,000 people. Their house was on a very quiet street with very few neighbors anywhere near them, and their property was right up against this forest that was right in their backyard. Their daughter, two-year-old Anna, loved to play in their backyard, but she was instructed to stay on the grass section of their backyard and not venture into the forest because the forest was snake infested and Anna was terrified of snakes, and so she happily obliged. On May 5th, 1950, Anna was playing in her backyard in that grassy section, and her mother was in the kitchen looking out the back window into the backyard, and her mother looked down for a second when she heard her daughter scream. She looked up, and Anna was gone. She immediately ran outside, and she's yelling for her daughter. She's looking all around, and she knows she must have gone into the forest, and she's thinking to herself, she must have been bit by a snake, and she's laying on the ground somewhere. That's why I can't see her. And so she runs into the forest and she's screaming for her daughter and she's not getting any response. She's starting to panic. All her yelling has gotten the attention of her two older sons that were in the house. They come running outside and they join the search and they start fanning out and they're looking for Anna and she's just gone. And so after only a few minutes of looking, Anna's mother decides she has to call the police. The police show up and they launch this massive search and word got out to the residents of Dunbar that one of their own had gone missing, a child no less. 
And so virtually everyone in Dunbar showed up to be a part of the search and they combed that whole forest behind their property and there was just no sign of Anna. After the first 24 hours had gone by and they had not found any sign of Anna, they decided to expand the search area from a one mile radius to a three mile radius. And within just hours of this change, there was a crew that was three miles away from where Anna had gone missing and they found Anna and she was alive. She was laying under this blackberry bush. All she had on was a single shoe. Next to her was a pile of clothes. When they went up to her, she seemed okay. They picked her up and they brought her back to the search headquarters where they reunited her with her parents. A doctor looked at her and the doctor said, you know, there's no signs that she was attacked. There's really no signs of any wear and tear on her at all. It doesn't even look like she was outside for the past 24 hours. When Anna was asked about what happened to her, she wasn't able to give any sort of meaningful answer because she's only two years old. But the reason this case is included in today's video is not because, you know, she vanished mysteriously in the forest and that she was actually found three miles away versus one or, you know, that she was found with just a shoe on. The reason it's included in today's video is because for her to have been found where she was found, the only way, the only way for her to have arrived at that spot was if she crossed 10 barbed wire fences. There was no other way for her to have gotten there. The only other way would have been a massive detour that she literally could not have covered. An adult probably couldn't have covered in the amount of time given. So this two-year-old with no scratches on her body is found on the other side of 10 barbed wire fences. I mean, even if you take the barbed wire off of the fence, a two-year-old climbing a large fence, that alone is kind of a Herculean task. And to do it without scratching your body, it's, it's, it's not possible. It's truly impossible. A May 7th article in the LA Times said the police were baffled by this 10 fence dilemma. And they said the only way it would make sense is if she had been abducted and dumped there. But the police also repeatedly said there was no evidence to suggest she had been abducted or attacked or harmed in any way. It was just where she was found did not add up. Ultimately, the police came out with a statement saying this had to have been an accident, that Anna, the two-year-old, managed to just somehow walk her way past all these fences and was found where she was, and thank goodness she's alive. But interestingly, the police confiscated her clothing and would not give that back to the parents, indicating there was further investigation happening even though the child had been found. But unfortunately, the police never revealed whether or not they actually discovered anything else about this case. And like in the Eldridge case, Anna's parents did not press for more information about what happened to their daughter because she was found alive and unharmed. Now, Anna's case might seem like some crazy anomaly and that's all it is. But this is not the first time something like this has happened in this small area in Pennsylvania. Two years earlier and less than 10 miles away from where Anna went missing, another two-year-old, Ronald Collier, also went missing in the same stretch of woods. His mother had been sitting with him on their back porch, which overlooked the same forest. And at some point his mother had gone inside, leaving Ronald sitting on one of the seats. When she came back out again, Ronald was gone. His mother estimated that she was inside for maybe 10 or 15 seconds tops. The police and the community came out in force and they combed through the woods and they could not find any sign of Ronald. And the police got really frustrated with Ronald's parents because they felt like this is impossible. How could this child not turn up considering the timeline you've given us, which is you went inside for 10, 15 seconds and your son is now completely gone. He's completely vanished. Like you must have something to do with this. And so the police made Ronald's parents take polygraph tests and his parents passed all of them. The search for Ronald continued for several weeks, but unfortunately it was ultimately terminated and they never found him. People in the area believe someone or something, maybe a bear or some other animal, was lurking in the tree line and watching Ronald. And as soon as his mother went in the house, they ran up and snatched the child and ran away with him. However, the police came out and said there was no evidence to back up that this child had been kidnapped, that what's far more likely is Ronald just got up and walked away and disappeared. However, two years later, when Anna's case happened, the similarities between her case and Ronald's case were just too much for locals to overlook. And so people began saying, you know, it looks like Anna was abducted and placed where she was ultimately found inside of those woods. And so probably whoever or whatever took Anna is the same person or thing that took Ronald but Anna was just lucky enough to survive. Although this mystery predator theory is just that, a theory, 
it does seem more likely than Ronald in 15 seconds getting up and running off into oblivion, never to be found again, and Anna scaling 10 barbed wire fences in a 24 hour period without a scratch on her body. Unfortunately though, we'll probably never know the truth. In September of 2004, 49-year-old Robert Springfield, along with his two teenage sons, left their home in Wyoming, bound for the Bighorn Mountains in Montana. They were planning to do some elk hunting on the Crow Reservation, which is the homeland of the Crow tribe, and Robert and his family were members of the Crow Reservation and therefore had the rights to hunt on that land. The specific spot the boys were going to be hunting was Black Canyon, a particularly steep and rugged area. But Robert was well equipped for this type of environment because he had previously served in the United States Marine Corps in their Special Operations Unit, which would have meant he would have received a very high level of outdoor survival training, which is perfect for living up in the mountains. Robert's sons had apparently learned a lot from him and were very competent outdoorsmen as well. They arrived at the reserve on September 19th and immediately headed out to do some bow and arrow hunting. Their plan was the two boys would break off from their father and head over to the edge of the canyon and attempt to drive elk down into the valley so their dad could take a shot at them. But late in the afternoon, the two teenage boys had not seen a single elk and so it was getting to be time to head back to the prearranged meeting spot. And so they packed up their stuff and they headed there. The boys make it to the meeting area and their father, Robert, is not there. So they sit down and they begin to wait. And an hour goes by, two hours goes by, three hours goes by, still no sign of their dad. They can't get in touch with him. They have no cell phone service. And so they're thinking to themselves, okay, you know, worst case scenario, he got turned around and he'll have to spend the night out in the cold, but he's got warm winter clothes on. He knows what he's doing, he'll be fine. And so as the sun was setting, the boys did finally leave to go tell authorities that their dad was, you know, lost in Black Canyon somewhere but it was just not registering for them that this could be life-threatening, that something really bad could have happened to their dad. He was just the Superman figure to them and it just did not cross their mind. Authorities launch a search that night that includes the use of helicopters with thermal imagers doing low flyovers of the entirety of Black Canyon. Thermal imagers pick up a heat signature, and so anyone that is alive gives off a heat signature. And so at night, if you were flying overhead and you saw a person in the middle of a canyon where there's virtually nothing else around them, they would stand out like a bright light. But that night, the helicopters combed all over Black Canyon and they never saw Robert. However, authorities would say that, you know, this guy, he's trained, you know, former special operator, he probably went and found shelter. So he could be inside of a cave or maybe he made himself a shelter with tree branches and it's obscuring him from the thermal imager. And so we'll just have to look tomorrow. But the next day, despite bringing out hundreds of searchers and bloodhounds and people on horseback and more helicopters and planes flying overhead, there was no sign of Robert. And after several weeks of still not finding any sign of Robert, they ultimately called it off. The family was obviously crushed, but more than that, they were just dumbfounded. The idea that something bad had happened to invincible Robert, that just didn't add up for them. And so after the official search was terminated, they would continue to make trips into Black Canyon looking for their father, their husband. But unfortunately, like all the searchers, they never found any trace of him and eventually accepted that he was gone. One year later, in October of 2005, a hunter who didn't know anything about Robert Springfield or the fact that he had disappeared, this hunter is in Black Canyon in the same area where Robert Springfield had disappeared. And this hunter is walking through this really dense forest. He's all alone, he's an experienced hunter, and he's not on a path, he's just kind of combing through the woods. And he starts to hear what sounds like a crow screeching. And at first, it doesn't really register with him. It's only in retrospect that he recalls this sequence of events. As he kept walking on, the screeching intensified to the point where he just could not ignore it. And so he stopped and turned to listen to the screeching crow that he couldn't see through the dense forest, but he could tell it was in that general direction. This hunter said as soon as he stopped, and he turned and began actively listening to this crow, he had this weird sensation that the crow was trying to actively communicate with him. It was a very strange experience. He had never had anything like it in his entire hunting career, and he spent lots of time outdoors. And so he felt like he had to go over and see what was going on with this crow. 
And so he starts walking towards the crow. He still can't see it. It's very thick vegetation and he's getting closer and closer and he gets to a place where he can just barely see this crow. It's in a clearing. There is this large tree stump right in the middle of the clearing. And this tree stump is not short. It's like six, seven, eight feet high in the air. It looks like this tree had broken in the middle and fallen over. And this crow is sitting on the top of this kind of gnarled stump. And the crow is just incessantly screeching. And from this hunter's perspective, he can see the crow and he's kind of staring at it. And as the hunter is looking at this crow, the crow suddenly turns and looks directly at the hunter. And it recognizes the hunter can see the crow and the crow stops screeching and is just staring directly at the hunter. And this hunter would say he felt so unsettled by the sudden behavior of the crow because it was almost like confirming the crow was looking for him. And now he had found him and he stopped screeching and was looking at him. The bird continued to stare silently at the hunter to the point where the hunter felt compelled to walk out of the vegetation into the clearing to kind of confront the crow. And so he stepped into the clearing and the crow the whole time is not screeching anymore, just looking at the hunter. And the hunter's standing in the clearing and he looks at the crow and the crow suddenly looks straight down. The hunter follows the crow's gaze down to the ground and he sees at the base of the tree is a human skull. And the hunter's so taken aback by this, he looks back up at the crow who's looking at him again. And the whole situation is so terrifying to this hunter that he just makes a note of where he is and he runs. As soon as the hunter got out of the woods and was back in cell phone reception, he called authorities, authorities showed up and he showed them on the map where he had discovered this crow and the skull next to a tree and sure enough the authorities make their way out and they find the skull right under this tree the crow at this point is gone when they walked up to the tree stump they discovered it was not just a human skull it was also a human femur bone right next to the skull and then next to that was a set of boots that had been placed right next to them neatly next to one another and then next to that was a belt that had been tightly wound up and placed next to the boots and then next to that was a jacket that was not folded but was balled up and inside of the jacket was a wallet containing cash and Robert Springfield's ID cards. The authorities launched a search in that area to look for the rest of Robert's remains, but unfortunately they were never recovered. Also his bow and arrows were never found. The FBI was brought into the case because foul play was suspected and they eventually determined that Robert must have been shot. And then they later recanted that statement and said actually he was hit by a falling tree. But if he was struck by a tree, then where is the rest of him? Wouldn't it have been in that area? And then why were all of his things neatly stacked? Certainly he wouldn't have done that after getting hit by a tree. So who neatly stacked his things after he was hit? And then also where is his bow and arrows? But despite how improbable it sounds, that is the official theory that he was hit by a falling tree. The family, along with many other people, believe he was attacked by someone or something up in those mountains. But if he had been attacked, his sons would have heard the struggle because they were in an area where sound carried really, really well. And if a person attacked him, why didn't they take the money out of his wallet? Also, where Robert's remains had been found was very close to where his original campsite had been with his two sons on the night he had gone missing. And so it was firmly located inside of the initial search grid, meaning had he been under a tree or been left for dead by some attacker in that area, he would have been found in those first couple of weeks that they were looking before the search was terminated. So the fact that he wasn't found means either hundreds of people didn't see him, including a helicopter with thermal imager, or he wasn't there until after the search was terminated. And if so, where was he? And perhaps the weirdest aspect of this entire case is the claim by this hunter that a crow apparently lured him over to this tree stump where he found Robert's remains. If you believe this hunter's story, and many, many people do, then do you really think it's a coincidence that all of this took place on Crow Reservation, home of the Crow tribe? I think not. But will we ever know the truth about what actually happened to Robert? I don't know. In 1994, 39-year-old Mauro Prosperi took part in the brutal Marathon des Sables, 
which is a six-day endurance race covering 155 miles through the Sahara Desert. The competition was known as one of the toughest in the world, but Prosperi was a former Olympic athlete, and he kept himself in unbelievable physical shape. He was also a police officer back in Italy, which kept him even more active, so he felt ready. The competition's desert terrain was so dangerous that participants had to indicate where they wanted their bodies sent if they did not survive the race. In preparation for the race, Prosperi would run 25 miles a day for weeks leading up to it, and he would give himself less and less water as he was running to get accustomed to dehydration. But despite how much he was training and his incredible athletic resume that showed he's someone that can probably do this, his wife was very concerned. But he would tell her, you know, the worst thing that's going to happen to me is I'll get a little sunburned. The race kicked off at its starting point in Morocco on April 10th, and initially it was going very smoothly. Prosperi was always at the front of the pack, and he was always the first Italian to finish that day's stage. And so when he would finish, he would go to his tent and he'd put an Italian flag on the outside to show the other Italians doing the race where they could find him to come inside and chat. And he would say that part of the race was really fun. Then things went wrong on the fourth day during the longest and most difficult phase of the race. When he set out that morning, it was already very windy and he found himself in this section between these two big sand dunes and the pace setters had already gone way ahead so he's totally alone. And then out of nowhere, this massive sandstorm kicks up and completely blinds him. He can't go anywhere because he can't see where he's going. And so he manages to kind of feel his way to this rock where he gets down behind this rock and he thinks to himself, I'll just wait it out and then continue on but the sandstorm raged for eight hours. And when it was finally done, it was totally dark outside, so Prosperi couldn't see anything. So he decides, you know what, I'm gonna have to sleep on the dunes and tomorrow morning I'll have to get up and keep going. And his biggest concern at this point was not that he was in a survival situation. It was, man, I was in fourth place in this race and now with this huge setback, I'm probably gonna finish last. And so when he went to sleep that night, all he was thinking about is, man, I gotta get up and go as fast as I can so I don't finish last tomorrow. But when the sun came up the next morning, Prosperi looked around and he realized he had a much bigger problem. The sandstorm had been so strong, it had completely altered the landscape. The dunes had all moved around. He had no points of reference. And so even though he had a map and he had a compass, he had no way to orient himself, so he had no idea what direction to go. Anybody that competed in this race really needed to be self-sufficient. And so Prosperi had a knife, he had plenty of dehydrated food, he had a sleeping bag, but he had very little water. He had about a half bottle of water because at each of the checkpoints during the day, the race officials would give you all of this water. And the idea was you would drink it all by the time you got to your next checkpoint. And he had not made it to the next checkpoint and so was very low on water. As he's looking around, realizing this is a really bad situation, he thinks to himself, you know, other runners must have had this same thing happen to them. They probably had to hunker down yesterday during the sandstorm and they're, they're just waking up now. They're looking around. I'm bound to find someone. We'll link up and we will get to the end of this race and we'll be just fine. And so he runs to the top of a sand dune and looks around expecting to see someone and he doesn't. There's no one in all directions. It's just completely barren desert. And so he leaves that sand dune, goes up another one, and does the same thing. He's looking around, and there's nobody there. And over the course of several hours, he was just running to the peaks of these different sand dunes, expecting to see someone, not seeing anyone, becoming more panicked and expending more energy. And finally, by the late afternoon, when he's sweating profusely and the sun is bearing down on him and he still hasn't seen anyone, he realizes he's gonna die if he keeps doing this and he needs to be smart about this. And so at this point, he went into survival mode and he decided that the only times he's gonna move are gonna be at night and in the early morning hours because those are the times when the sun is not up and it's still pretty cool and he can conserve energy that way. He also began peeing into bottles and began conserving his urine to drink later when he did run out of water. And so over the next two days, he conserved his energy, but he was just kind of drifting through the desert and he wasn't really getting anywhere. He didn't know if he was making progress because he had nothing to go to. He wasn't seeing anyone and he was starting to realize the situation is getting worse and worse by the minute. And then in an incredible stroke of luck, he comes across this Muslim shrine in the middle of nowhere that Bedouins would use as they traveled across the desert. And he ran inside hoping that there'd be a person in there. And there was a person in there, but they were dead inside of a coffin. But he was happy that he now had shelter over his head and this felt like progress. He began taking stock of his new surroundings and when he was inside the shrine looking up into the ceiling, he saw it was lined with hundreds of bats. And at this point, he's really hungry, he's really thirsty, 
and so he climbed up into the rafters and began grabbing handfuls of bats and drinking their blood. After drinking the blood of 20 bats, he used some of the wood that was inside of the shrine and he built a fire outside. And that would be his way to signal planes and helicopters going overhead that he assumed would be out looking for him. And so he sets the fire and he comes back inside expecting, you know, over the next couple of days, someone's bound to find him, but nobody does. And four days go by and three separate times, a plane or a helicopter flew directly over him. He's got his fire going, he's out there flagging him down, but nobody saw him. And so at the end of those four days, he's now been out in the desert roaming around for nearly a week. And he's starting to realize that this is the end. He's not going to survive this. No one knows where he is. No one's seen him so far. He's running out of supplies. This is it. And so knowing he was staring down a long, painful death, either by dehydration or starvation, he decided he was going to expedite it. And he would say later that he did not feel sad about this. It just was a logical choice he was making. He figured this way, if he died inside of the shrine, the shrine was more likely to be found than if he had died somewhere out in the desert where sand would cover him up. And so he said it was more likely people would find the shrine and therefore find him. And so there'd be closure for his family. And so Prosperi took a piece of charcoal from the fire, wrote a message to his wife, and then cut his wrists and laid down expecting never to wake up again. But the next morning he woke up and he had barely bled because his blood was too thick. He literally could not bleed to death. He took this as a sign that he was supposed to live and he suddenly felt motivated to survive. He decided to leave the shrine and follow the advice that one of the race organizers had given all of them at the start, which was if you get lost, follow the clouds you can see just beyond the horizon at dawn, there you will find civilization. So Prosperi hopped up and began heading towards what he believed were those clouds. He walked for days in the desert, grabbing snakes and lizards off the ground and eating them raw. He said his inner caveman came out like his primal desire to live and he had no problems eating the things he was eating. Prosperi grew so dehydrated he couldn't even urinate anymore. So he began drinking the liquid inside of succulents that grew inside of dried up riverbeds and he also began sucking out the moisture in his wet wipes that were in his backpack. On the ninth day Prosperi saw a little shepherd girl off in the distance and she saw him and she was scared of him and she turned and ran away and at first Prosperi is devastated because he has no strength to chase after her but she had actually gone down to her tribe and told them about this strange man wandering the desert and they came running up over the dunes and they brought him in and they gave him food and drink and they sent someone to get police. After police picked him up and brought him back to their headquarters, he discovered he had walked over 181 miles from where he had gotten lost on the course all the way to Algeria. His family and race organizers had gone out looking for him after he went missing, but all they ever found was his shoelace. And so they assumed he was dead. It would take him two years to fully recover from this ordeal, but after he did, he went on to run eight more desert races. In 2012, 35-year-old Jose Alvarenga was an extremely experienced fisherman, having spent years and years commercially fishing. In November of that year, Jose volunteered to do a 30-hour deep-sea fishing shift for his company off the coast of his hometown in Mexico. He hoped he'd be able to catch some sharks, marlins, and sailfish, three of the more lucrative fish you can catch. Unfortunately, the guy Jose usually went deep sea fishing with was not able to go at the last minute, but Jose still really wanted to go out and do the shift. And so he took the only other fisherman in their company that was willing to go or that could go. And it was a 23 year old, extremely inexperienced, brand new fisherman named Ezekiel Cordoba. And while Jose knew he was not gonna be a huge asset out on the seas, he figured, you know, it's a short trip and we're not that far off from shore. So you know what? He's fine. I'll take him. On November 17th, the pair set out on their 24 foot fiberglass skiff with a small motor. On board were various fishing tools, a radio, and a large ice box to hold all the fish they were going to catch. Once they reached the area they were going to be fishing, their trip immediately started paying off. And within just a couple of hours, they had already almost completely overloaded the ice box. Their luck was so good that when they saw a storm coming in, they decided to wait and continue to catch as many fish as they possibly could before heading in at the very last minute. But the storm that was rolling in was like the storm of the century. And by the time they did turn around to head into shore, it was too late. They got caught up in this wicked storm where the rain was so intense, they literally could not see to shore. They tried to use their compass and other instruments to navigate to shore, but between the winds and the waves and the fact that their boat was so heavy from the nearly thousand pounds, 
of fish they had caught, they were just really unable to get anywhere near shore. When the storm just continued to rage and they were just kind of floundering in the water, they decided they needed to dump their catch. So they dumped all 1,000 plus pounds of fish back into the water. But even then, with a more agile boat, the storm was so severe, they just could not navigate effectively. And so Jose turned off the engine and told Ezekiel that their best chance here was to just wait it out. And once it was done, they would head back into shore. But that storm continued to rage for five days. The torrential rain never stopped. The waves were huge. The winds were awful. And before long, they were getting pulled out to sea and had no idea where they were. Now, they had only planned to be out for 30 hours, so they did not have much in the way of supplies. And so after a few days, they had run out of food and they had run out of water. But luckily, because it was raining so much, they were able to drink the rainwater. But the real immediate problem they were facing is over the course of those five days, the storm was just battering their boat and by the time the storm cleared their boat was ruined their motor had been torn off and was just gone their electronics were busted and all of their fishing gear was either damaged or gone there was enough charge in the radio for jose to call back to his boss on the mainland and send a mayday message but the radio died before they got a return message so they weren't able to confirm if anybody on land was going to come looking for them Left with minimal supplies, no radio, no motor, Jose and Ezekiel just had to hope somebody on the mainland heard their message and they slowly began to adjust to life at sea. Jose was able to leap into the water and catch turtles, fish, seabirds, and jellyfish with his bare hands, and so that's what they ate. And then the two of them would try to catch rainwater whenever they could, but the majority of the time they had to drink their own urine and turtle blood. Despite their initial optimism that their boss had probably heard their mayday message and would be sending people out to get them, as days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, they realized that probably no one was coming to find them. Now their only hope was a plane spotted them flying overhead, or perhaps they could drift into a shipping lane and a boat could spot them. But without any way of navigating their boat, they really were just leaving it up to luck. Despite their dire situation, Jose stayed really positive and he focused on catching food and catching water and he tracked the time really diligently by tracking the phases of the moon. Ezekiel, however, just did not have a significant role on the boat because he just wasn't skilled enough and so he found himself sitting in the boat most of the time doing a whole lot of nothing and he fell into a deep depression. He was not accustomed to being out on the water the way Jose was. Jose had been raised on the water. He practically only ate seafood and a lot of it he ate raw. So in a way, Jose was kind of at home, Ezekiel was not. And then by the fourth month, Ezekiel just could no longer stomach the food they were eating. He would just get sick every single time. And so he just kind of gave up and he stopped eating. And even though Jose urged him to eat and would get him food, he didn't eat it and eventually he starved to death. Even though Ezekiel was not a huge asset in terms of helping them survive, he did provide Jose an enormous amount of comfort. It was like you had your partner in crime here. And then once he died, Jose was alone for the first time in nearly half a year and he fell into a very dark depression. And for six days, he did not touch Ezekiel's body. He just sat there and stared at him and even contemplated taking his own life. But on the seventh day, he doesn't know what it was, but he had this sudden urge to want to survive. And so he gave Ezekiel a kind of makeshift funeral. He said a few words and then disposed of his body in the ocean. And then after that, Jose became laser focused on just surviving. And survive he would for another nine months, all by himself, out in the middle of the ocean, just floating around, drinking turtle's blood and drinking his own pee. But after those nine months, he would finally see the thing he had been dreaming about, land. He had managed to drift all the way to the Marshall Islands. So he leapt out of his boat, he swam to shore, and there was a hut right on the beach. He knocked on the hut and a couple came to the door and they were totally shocked to see this guy. I mean, he, he didn't look too good. And they couldn't even believe his story. They, they couldn't believe that he had survived for so long in the water. But they quickly brought him inside, they gave him some food and drink, and they contacted authorities, and he was saved. His parents and young daughter, when they found out he was alive, they were overjoyed. They, along with everybody else, believed he had perished. They had sent out a search party for them and they'd found pieces of their boat that had broken off in the storm. And so they assumed, you know, they must have sank. Then in a strange turn of events, shortly after he got home, people began accusing him of lying about what happened. People said he looked too good to have been out on the open ocean for 14 months. He should have been emaciated and at the very least he should have had scurvy. But doctors would say he ate so many turtles and seabirds that he was pretty well fed. 
and turtles and seabirds contain a high level of vitamin C that would have protected him from scurvy. Other skeptics said it would have been impossible for his skiff to float the 6,000 miles to the Marshall Islands where he ultimately found land. But then a study done at the University of Hawaii confirmed there was a current that would have pulled him from the coast of Mexico straight into the Marshall Islands. And then lastly, Ezekiel Cordoba's family accused Jose of killing Ezekiel and eating his body for sustenance. That's the only way he was able to survive. But Ezekiel roundly rejected that and took multiple lie detector tests that proved he did not do that. Today, Jose lives in a small town in El Salvador, completely surrounded by land, and he says he doesn't go anywhere near the water. In 1971, Julian Kepka was a bright-eyed German teenager who had just graduated high school. On Christmas Eve of 1971, she and her mother were at the airport in Lima, Peru, waiting for a flight to Pacopa to visit her father, who was a zoologist working in the Amazon. She and her mother and everybody else waiting for this flight were really annoyed because the flight was seven hours late due to bad weather. Finally, it arrived and Julianne, her mother, and everybody else who had been waiting boarded Lanza Flight 508. And immediately after takeoff, they started hitting some pretty bad turbulence because of the bad weather. But Julianne really liked flying, so she didn't mind. Her mother, on the other hand, was white knuckling the armrests. But after 10 minutes or so, as they were getting nearer to cruising altitude, the turbulence was not getting any better. In fact, it was getting much worse. And Julianne was starting to get worried herself. And then when the plane started shaking so violently that all of the overhead bins opened up and luggage and wrapped presents and Christmas cake started pouring out, Julianne now began white knuckling the armrest. As she's sitting there, she looks out the window and she sees all this lightning right outside their window. And it was clear they were literally flying through a lightning storm. And so Julianne and her mother are just looking at each other, unable to speak because they're so scared. And they're listening to the other passengers screaming and yelling and everyone's starting to panic. And then the plane starts really shaking up and down like it's being lifted 50 feet and dropping 50 feet over and over. And then all of a sudden there's this bright flash inside of the cabin and then the lights go out and then they look out the left side and they see smoke and flames coming out of the engine that sits on the wing. And then the plane felt like it was just falling from the sky before it dipped into an aggressive nosedive and just started bombing straight down toward the ground. It turned out that big flash in the cabin was lightning striking the engine. Julianne would say, despite this unbelievable chaos, the worst moment imaginable, her mother grabbed her by the hand and said, this is it, it's all over. And that was the last thing her mother ever said to her. After that, all Julianne can remember is the sound of other passengers screaming and crying and the awful grinding sounds that the engines were making. And as she's listening to these horrible sounds getting ready to die, all of a sudden the noise just stops and she's outside of the plane. She's still strapped into her seat, but now she's in free fall away from the plane. And she remembers thinking how unbelievably lonely she was. And then she looked down and she saw the canopy of the jungle fast approaching and she knew she was about to die and then she passed out. She remembers nothing of the actual impact, but she would later find out the plane broke up two miles up. So she was in free fall for two miles in that seat before hitting the ground. She woke up the next day looking upwards towards the jungle canopy, and the first thing she said out loud was, I survived. And she's looking around and she yells for her mother, but there's no one around her, no one yells back. And that's when she realizes I'm all alone and probably everybody, including my mother, is dead. She had somehow managed to not only survive, but only have a broken collarbone and some deep cuts in her leg. She could hear planes overhead that were most likely looking for the crash site and potentially survivors, but she couldn't see them because the canopy was so thick, so they couldn't see her. She was wearing a very short sleeveless mini dress and flip flops, but in fact, she had lost one of her flip flops, but elected to keep the other one on because she had lost her glasses in the crash and she was incredibly nearsighted. And so she would use this one flip flop to test the ground ahead of her before committing with her bare foot. Before the crash, she had spent a year and a half at her parents' research station out in the Amazon. And in that time, she'd picked up very valuable survival skills for being being in the rainforest. So the first thing she did was stand up and go looking for a stream because her father had told her, wherever there's a stream, that stream will oftentimes lead to civilization. And so she began walking and sure enough, she found a stream. And instead of just walking next to the stream, she got in it and began walking directly in the middle of the stream because her parents had told her that you're less likely to get attacked by a predator if you're standing in the water versus standing on land. She only walked a little ways before she came across the crash site. There was no bodies, it was just debris, and all she could find that was useful was a small bag of candy. So she took the bag of candy and continued walking down the 
the stream. And for several days, she trudged along and she would say during the day, it was incredibly hot and miserable. And at night, it was very cold. And since she only had this small dress on, it was particularly miserable. But she said the scariest part of the whole ordeal was at night when you're trying to sleep, it's totally pitch black and you're in the middle of the Amazon and there's predators all around you. She said it was horrifying. On the fourth day of being in the jungle, as she walked down the stream, she heard the sound of a landing king vulture, a sound that she recognized from her time spent at her parents' Amazon reserve. And the sound of this vulture was just around the corner, so she couldn't see it, but she knew these huge vultures only showed up if there's a ton of dead meat. And so she knew as soon as she rounded that corner, she was going to come face to face with the bodies from the crash, potentially even her mother. But she kept moving forward, she turned the corner, and sure enough, there were bodies. The vulture took off, and what she was left looking at was a bench with three passengers on it still buckled in, and all three of their heads had been rammed underneath the earth. They had clearly landed head first. Immediately, she had an intense sense of panic because she had never seen a dead body before, and she thought one of them was her mother. But when she went over to examine this particular corpse, she saw her toenails were painted pink, and her mother never painted her toenails. And so she had this intense sense of relief that it wasn't her mother, but at the same time felt very ashamed of that thought. There was nothing on the three bodies or near them that could help her survive, and so she said her goodbyes and she continued walking down the stream. By the 10th day of this ordeal, she could barely stand straight because of a broken collarbone and the pain in her leg. And so she began drifting down the river in one of the deeper sections. And then she thought she was hallucinating when she saw this big boat docked up against the side of the river. But when she went up to it and touched it, it was real. She went up on shore, she looked inside, there was no one in the boat, but it looked like a boat that was used. And there was a path that led back into the jungle. And so she followed the path and it led to this hut and no one was in there, but outside was a jug of gasoline. And she had this wound in her arm that was full of maggots. And she remembered her father using gasoline to get maggots out of a wound in their dog. And so she took the gasoline and dumped it in her arm and she said it was excruciatingly painful, but she was able to pull out 30 maggots and felt very proud of that accomplishment. After that, she fell asleep inside of the hut and just hoped that whoever lived here eventually showed up. And sure enough, the next day she woke up and she heard two men talking outside that were walking towards her. And she said the sound of their voice was like the sound of an angel. And when the two men came up the path and saw her, they were obviously very shocked. And they initially thought she was like this water goddess from a local legend that involved a half mermaid, half woman that was light skinned. And she would tell them in Spanish that she's not a water goddess, that in fact, she's a girl and she had just survived a plane crash and she really needed their help. It was getting late that day, so they couldn't bring her out of the jungle right away. So they helped treat her wounds. They gave her some food and water. And the next day they brought her back to civilization. The day after her rescue, she was reunited with her father and apparently he was so overcome with emotion because he believed she was dead that for several hours he just couldn't speak. Julianne was the sole survivor of the 91 people who boarded Lance Flight 508. Her mother actually survived the crash but then died several days later because she couldn't move. This is something that haunts Julianne and her family because they think about how horrible those last few moments for her mother must have been. Julianne ultimately recovered from all of her physical injuries but to this day deals with significant emotional trauma. In October of 2007, Helena Carroll and her fiance, John Cullen, had saved a little bit of money and they were torn on what to do with it. They knew they should put it aside and put it towards a down payment on a new house, but they also really wanted to go on vacation and lately life had been very stressful for both of them. And so ultimately they decided, let's just blow it all on an amazing vacation. And so later that month, they flew off to Thailand. Over the course of their week, they spent most of their time at their resort, sitting in the pool and eating nice food. And they were having this really nice time. And on their last day, they decided they needed to do something a little bit more adventurous. And so they decided to explore the Nam Talu Cave inside of the Khao Sok National Park, which is this 160 million year old rainforest that was not that close to their resort. In fact, it was not really a huge tourist destination because of how cumbersome it was to get there. But from everything they read about this park and specifically this cave they wanted to go in, it was just this breathtaking experience and so they were sold. After signing up for a guided tour, they headed down to the pier where they boarded a boat and drove 90 minutes to the entrance of this park 
When they got off, they met their two guides and then walked down to this entrance area where they connected with the other five tourists that were gonna be on this tour with them. Those five people were two Swiss parents and their two teenage daughters, along with a 10 year old German boy who was there on his own. After everyone had said hello and introduced themselves, they began walking through the park towards this cave. The allure of the Nam Talu cave, which is the cave they were gonna be going to, was there was a river that ran through it where at times as you walked through this cave, you'd have to hold onto a rope and wade through the water where the water was up to your waist or even up to your neck at times but it felt safe and controlled, and it was kind of exhilarating for foreign tourists to go through the cave. As they were just about to get to the entrance of the Nam Talu cave, some park rangers happened to walk down the path next to them, and they exchanged some words with the two local guides that were leading this tour, and they told them it's a bad idea to go into the Nam Talu cave because this is the monsoon season. No one's supposed to be in there, and if it starts raining while you're inside the cave, you won't hear it, and it will flood the cave, and then you'll be trapped. But despite the warning, the group continued on, because it hadn't rained that day and there wasn't any rain in the forecast and the two local guides that were leading this tour were really confident that they were not in danger. They entered the cave a little after 1 p.m. and right away they were walking through little puddles of water that got a little bit deeper and pretty soon they were holding onto the rope and walking through the deeper sections of the cave. You know, water's up to their waist and by all accounts it was very exciting. And the entirety of the tour should only take about an hour where it's 30 minutes in, you hit the turnaround point and you come back. And they had made it about 20 to 25 minutes in right before the turnaround point when Helena and John, who were towards the front of the tour group, heard what sounded like a rushing or roaring sound coming from the entrance of the cave. And they turned around and they saw this wave of water barreling into the cave. And instinctively, John and Helena start climbing up the walls. And luckily there was a ledge where they were and they managed to scramble up onto this ledge and Helena would say as soon as she got up there she turned around to look where she had just been standing right as this surge of water blasted past them carrying with it the two tour guides and the 10 year old German boy who immediately got swept around the corner down the dark tunnel and then seconds later the two Swiss parents and their teenage daughters they got swept away around the corner. The couple was now stranded on this ledge with no time to be upset about what they're witnessing because the water was not only surging past them, it was rising and there was limited amount of space before they would just be completely submerged in water. And so they tried their best to climb up this wall to a slightly higher ledge, which was still only a few feet away from these rushing rapids. And so as they're crouched up on this ledge, John eventually says to Helena, you know, we're gonna die if we stay here, we're gonna drown. And so I need to find a way to maybe get past this initial rush of water and maybe on the far side of the cave I can work my way back up to the entrance and hopefully get us some help and initially Helena said don't do it don't leave we're safe here but eventually he said to her I have to go I love you I have to go and she said okay and he jumped into the water and almost immediately he was pulled under and disappeared for the next 20 hours, Helena had to sit on this ledge in total darkness until the water finally began to subside a little bit and rescuers could come in to get her. What had happened was after Helena and the rest of the tour group had gone inside of the cave, they made it just far enough in that they were out of earshot of what was happening outside of the cave. Right at that moment, a huge freak storm rolled in. There was this flash flood that was so intense, the lake that was right outside of the entrance to this cave, it rose up and began dumping directly into the cave. It was like a dam basically breaking and all the water just poured in all at once. When Helena was finally let out of the cave, she didn't know what happened to her fiance or the other tourists that were part of the group. But as soon as she stepped outside, she saw there were eight coffins that had been lined up right outside and she found out that she was the sole survivor. Despite this tragedy, people still go into the Nam Talu cave even during monsoon season. In 2014, 35-year-old Darren Spivey was a passionate scuba diver, and he wanted to share that passion with his 15-year-old son, Dylan. So on Christmas Eve that year, he gave his son an early gift, scuba tanks. The pair was apparently so excited to use them that they planned on doing an early morning dive the very next day on Christmas. Later, Dylan's grandmother would tell the media that her grandson actually didn't really want to go on this dive trip, but he knew his dad did and he adored his father and didn't want to let him down, so he decided to go anyways. The following morning, the father and son got up and they made their way to a local dive site, only to discover that the gate to the dive site was locked. The father still really wanted to do this dive, and so he decided he would take them to another dive site in Central Florida, which was inside of a wildlife management area that he knew was open 24-7 to hunters and hikers and divers. 
So the pair drove over to the entrance of this park and sure enough it was open and so they went through and began driving down these windy back roads until they finally reached this dirt lot that was right next to a pond. They got out of the car, they put on their wetsuits and their scuba gear and began waddling their way over to this wooden walkway that starts in the parking lot and goes all the way up and out onto the pond like a dock. And as they walked down this wooden walkway, they would have passed a number of signs telling them, do not dive in this pond unless you're an expert diver. Because this is not just some pond. This pond was the entrance to the infamous and deadly Eagle's Nest, which in the cave diving community is known as the Mount Everest of cave diving. At the bottom of this little placid seeming pond is a narrow hole that is a tunnel that goes straight down and that is the single way in or out of this massive underwater cave system. Expert divers will swim over to this hole and grab the guideline that goes down into this cave and they'll follow it and they'll swim straight down until the light above them fades and all they can see below them is just black nothingness. And once they get through the end of this tunnel, it opens up into this massive chasm that's called the ballroom. And as soon as you get into the ballroom, if you stop and shine your light in any direction, you will not see a wall. No matter how powerful your flashlight is, you can't see a wall, it's so big. Divers that have been down there have said it feels like you're in outer space. This guideline goes straight down to the bottom of the ballroom at about 130 feet, at which point you see a sign that has a grim reaper on it that says, stop, prevent your own death, do not go any farther. There's nothing in this cave that is worth dying for. Basically, this is your last chance to turn around and get to the surface relatively easily, because from this sign, the cave splits off in two different directions, where the tunnel gets narrower and it kind of spiders around, and in certain points, it goes all the way down to 300 feet. So beyond this sign, it is extremely extremely dangerous unless you know what you're doing. And even then, it's still extremely dangerous. There's also a current that runs through Eagle's Nest. So if you were to lose the guideline, especially in the ballroom, you could be blown away and then have a really hard time finding it again because it's pitch black down there and it's like finding a needle in a haystack. And if you're not holding onto the guideline, it's nearly impossible to find the one way out. So you understand how intimidating and dark and dangerous this place is. Here's a video of a diver going through that tunnel into the ballroom. Down there, there's a warning sign or a stop sign, warning divers that aren't trained for this type of diving, cave trained or trimix trained, uh, to, to not go any further, to help, help save lives. Um, a lot of divers have died trying to do these types of dives. And the thing is, at these depths, small mistakes can cost lives. So the sign is there just as a warning to, to help prevent any future accidents. But as Darren and Dylan sat at the end of the walkway getting ready to jump into this pond, they were unfazed by the countless warnings, even though neither of them were expert divers. In fact, Dylan wasn't even a certified diver at all. This was one of his first dives. Before the pair jumped into the water, Darren texted his fiance and said they were at Eagle's Nest and they were about to do this dive and that he would call when they got back to the surface. After that, he put his phone away on the surface and the two of them jumped into the water and started swimming their way over to the entrance to Eagle's Nest. Hours went by and Darren's fiance did not get a call from Darren. And so by the time the sun was going down, she decided she had to go check on them. So she hopped in the car and she drove to the parking lot at Eagle's Nest and she saw Darren's car and no sign of the boys anywhere. Police were called and very quickly professional divers were brought to Eagle's Nest to go down and see if they were still down there. The divers got in the water, they made their way over to the narrow entrance, they went down the tunnel, they entered into the ballroom, and they stopped holding onto the guideline. They pulled out their flashlights and began scanning around the ceiling immediately inside of the ballroom. 
because they had done this before and it was not uncommon to have fatalities inside of caves be near the entrance. And as they're scanning around, they stop when they see Dylan's lifeless body trapped up against the ceiling about six feet away from the entrance. He had inflated his water wings, which are emergency flotation devices. His mouthpiece was out of his mouth and it would turn out he had no more air left in his tanks. After the divers retrieved Dylan's body, they went back into Eagle's Nest and they went all the way down following the guideline to the bottom of the ballroom where they found Darren. He was laying on a little sandy hill, his mouthpiece was out, he also had no air left in his tanks, and he was laying right next to the famous sign that has the Grim Reaper on it that says stop, prevent your own death, don't go any farther. Both Darren and Dylan's gauges showed they'd gone down to 230 feet. For reference, between zero and 130 feet is considered recreational diving. And so in those depths, you can breathe regular air. So the same air you breathe on the surface is the air that goes in your tanks. You don't need really special training. You can kind of do whatever you want in those depths. Below 130 feet, you need to breathe a special gas mix. You need special equipment and you definitely need specialized training. All three of those things Dylan and Darren did not have. After an investigation was done into their deaths, it was determined it was an accident, and the going theory was they went through the entrance into the ballroom, they went all the way down, and then they went into one of the two tunnels that spiders off to the side, and they managed to go all the way down to 230 feet, and at that depth, they must have developed a nasty case of nitrogen narcosis, which is like being drunk. And so in that state, they must have lost track of time and how much air they were using. And so by the time they got back to the ballroom to begin their ascent, they ran out of air. The son must have run out first and grabbed his father, shown him his air gauge to point out that he has no air left. His dad, in seeing that, must have taken his regulator out and put it in his son's mouth, and they began buddy breathing as they ascended to the exit. Except the father's tanks also ran out of air very shortly after that, and the father passed out and sank to the bottom. The son managed to get a full breath of air and began trying to swim as fast as he could to the surface. He even inflated his water wings to make himself go faster. Except in his panic, he must have let go of the guideline and swam all the way up and then hit the ceiling and then been not able to find the way out and ultimately drowned. Today, despite all the warnings outside and inside of the cave itself telling inexperienced divers to not go any farther, inexperienced divers continue to go into Eagle's Nest and inexperienced divers continue to die inside of Eagle's Nest. To date, 11 people have died inside of that cave. Midday on June 10th, 1981, an Italian man and a six-year-old son walked to the edge of their property in Frascati, which is an area in Italy known as the hub of Rome's local wine industry. The father needed to repair a section of their fence, and his son, who he said had the soul of Huckleberry Finn, wanted to tag along. But as soon as the work began, Alfredo just wanted to go play in the vineyards, and so he ran off. And the father didn't think much of it, because his son always played in the vineyards and just figured he would see him back at the house. When the father finished up the work around 7 p.m. and walked back into his house, he was surprised that Alfredo wasn't there. And so he asked his wife, you know, have you seen our son? And she said, no, can you go out and find him? Because dinner's going to be on the table any minute. So the father goes back outside, expecting to see Alfredo come running out from behind some hiding place. But he doesn't. And he yells out for his son and doesn't get a response. And so he begins walking his property and yelling for Alfredo and he's not finding him. And so after two hours of looking, he finally just calls the police. The police arrive and initially it's just a couple of officers with flashlights and they spend about two hours looking as well. They can't find him. So they call in backup in the form of officers with sniffer dogs and the dogs began searching the property for another three hours and they still couldn't find him. A little after midnight, the fire department known in Italy as the fire brigade, they joined in as well. Shortly thereafter, a fire brigade officer was on the edge of Alfredo's property when he discovered a small hole in the ground. It would turn out Alfredo's neighbor had dug an illegal well, which was a common practice at the time. And generally, if you dug one of these wells and you struck water, you would report the well. But if you dug down and you didn't find water, you would just cover it up with a girder and you wouldn't tell anyone. In this case, however, the hole the officer was looking at did not have anything covering it. And so he knelt down and he yelled Alfredo's name into this hole. And at first he didn't hear anything. Then he yelled again and he heard Alfredo yell back for his mother. Alfredo must not have seen the opening as he was running around playing and he fell feet first into an 80 meter deep shaft. After Alfredo was found, the fire brigade took over rescue efforts, and so additional fire brigade units were called to help. But as soon as those additional units showed up, the captains of the different units began arguing with each other because it wasn't really clear how they were going to get him out. And unfortunately, the fire brigade immediately made a very bad decision. They decided to lower a plank into the shaft attached by a rope 
that he could grab onto and they could pull him out that way. But when they lowered it at about 24 meters, the plank got stuck inside of the tunnel. And when they yanked on the rope to try to free it, the rope came off of the plank, but the plank remained wedged in the tunnel, blocking the tunnel. By the following morning, TV crews had swarmed the area, and one of them offered up a two-way microphone that could be lowered down into the hole so they could talk directly to Alfredo. When the microphone was finally lowered down next to his face, he was crying and pleading for them to get him out and that he missed his mother. Amateur spelunker Tullio Barnaby, a 23-year-old, had come over and joined the vigil that night. The plank plan shocked him for its foolishness, and so too did the scene. It was like everyone and no one was in charge. The well opening had been widened in hopes that a very skinny person would be willing to be lowered down to remove the piece of wood that was obstructing the tunnel. And since Tolio was a spelunker and was comfortable in confined spaces and was pretty skinny, he volunteered himself to do it. As he was lowered down, he quickly realized the inside of this tunnel was not a straight shot. It was more like a corkscrew. And so because of its windy nature, he was not able to get down to the wood. And so he signaled to go back up again. And when he reached the surface, you know, he didn't have the wood in hand, but he told the fire brigade that because of the windy nature, it's unlikely Alfredo fell all the way to the bottom. He's probably stuck somewhere in the middle, which is a good thing. But we have to be really careful as we pull him out that we don't do anything that unintentionally causes him to slip farther into the hole. Tilio's suggestion was they go out and recruit professional spelunkers to be involved in the rescue because they would understand how to get someone out of such a tight space so far down in the ground. But the fire brigade disregarded his advice and said we don't have enough time for that. At 6 a.m. the next day, about 12 hours after Alfredo's fallen into the swell, the fire brigade would make another very poor decision. They decided they would drill down another hole parallel to the one Alfredo was in, and they would drill down past the point they believed Alfredo was, at which point they would turn and drill laterally and connect to the tunnel Alfredo's in, grabbing Alfredo, pulling him across, and back up the new tunnel. Tullio objected, and he said the vibrations from this drill are almost certainly going to dislodge the boy and cause him to slip farther into the tunnel. But once again, the fire brigade did not listen to him. The drilling began about two hours later, and by that afternoon, Alfredo's plight had become major national news, with every single TV station playing a 24-7 live broadcast of the well watching the drilling take place. Even the Italian president made a special trip to the well to see how it was going. But the drilling was very slow, and Alfredo, he had that microphone next to his head, and he was crying half the time, and the other times he was just pleading with them to get him out and saying he was cold or that he was tired, and the rescuers would say, we're gonna be down there to get you, don't fall asleep, we're gonna get you out of there. Finally, after 36 hours, they had drilled all the way down to their intended stopping point, and they began drilling across into Alfredo's well. When they finally broke into Alfredo's well, rescuers rushed in with flashlights and looked up and looked down, and there was no sign of Alfredo. And they called it up to the top, and they said, he's not here. And then all of a sudden, they heard a faint voice coming from all the way down at the bottom of the well. The vibrations from all of the drilling had indeed caused Alfredo to slip all the way to the very bottom. They estimated he was approximately 30 meters below this new parallel tunnel, and at that depth, the temperatures would be freezing. And so now Alfredo, on top of everything else, was facing hypothermia. They quickly lowered the microphone again down to Alfredo, and they told him, we're going to get you out of there. We're sorry we dropped you, but we're going to get you. And Alfredo's voice came back weak. He was tired, he was sore, he was freezing, he was crying. It was like the situation was just getting so much worse by the second and rescuers knew they had to get to him probably in the next couple of hours or that was it. And so another skinny man volunteered to go down into the hole and they lowered him and he would go all the way down to the bottom where Alfredo was. And he would call up that he found him and that Alfredo was alive. But Alfredo was stuck waist deep in this mud that the guy could not pull him out of. And so every time he'd begin to raise him slightly out of the mud, he'd lose his grip and he would fall back into the mud, going deeper into the mud each time. And after the seventh time of not being able to do it, Alfredo was getting dangerously close to being neck deep in the mud. And so the guy had to be pulled back out again. As soon as he was pulled back out again, more men volunteered themselves to go in there and try to yank him out. But many of them were not able to even get down to Alfredo. They would get stuck along the way. A couple did get to Alfredo, but they said his condition was worsening. He was weak. He wasn't even assisting trying to get pulled out. It was clear they were reaching the end. Finally, at 6.36 a.m. on Saturday, so two and a half days after Alfredo fell in, they could not get him to respond on that two-way microphone. And so they sent down a sonar probe and they could not detect a heartbeat and doctors declared him dead. 
The next day, liquid nitrogen was poured into the hole to preserve the body, and then 31 days later, they were finally able to extract it. After it was all over, the 25 million plus people that watched this take place live on television were crushed with what happened to Alfredo. There was a general sense that lots of people let this poor child down, which led to his death. But the person who was ultimately held accountable for it was the neighbor who had illegally dug the well. And so the neighbor was charged with manslaughter and was sent to jail, but their sentence is not publicly available online. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please tell the like button you are sorry for all the hostility this year and that you want to take them on vacation as a way of making up for it. When they agree, take them to Skinwalker Ranch and promptly punt them through the portal.